thanks you all for being here. And to those at home, thanks for watching, including Noel Bernal, our city manager, who's a little bit under the weather. I'm sure he's watching somewhere. So thanks, y'all. Yes. Good evening. Notice of the public meeting of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville pursuant to Chapter 551, Title 5 of the Texas Government Code, the Texas Open Meetings Act notice is hereby given that the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, in accordance with Article 5, Section 12 of the Charter of said city, will convene a regular meeting on Tuesday, November 5, 2019 at 5 p.m. in the Commission Chambers on the second floor of Brownsville City Hall, Old Federal Building, located at 1001 East Elizabeth Street, Brownsville, Cameron County, Texas. Would everyone please rise for the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. You're the God who knows the beginning from the end, the one with all true wisdom. And so tonight we ask you for wisdom for our mayor and our city commissioners and everyone who presents anything tonight. Lead and guide each department head. And Lord God, we ask you to continue to keep us in unity, doing what's best for the city of Brownsville. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In honor of the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. At this time, we are going to present the proclamation for Municipal Pork Week. If y'all would please come up. I got, I got one. Yeah. Just hold, <laughs> hold it out, uh, facing out. Yeah. Y'all ready? Okay. May I, Mayor? Yes. A proclamation of the City Commission of Brownsville, Texas, designating November 4th through 8th, 2019, as Municipal Court Week. Whereas the Brownsville Municipal Court, a time honored and vital part of local government, has been in existence since December 26, 1941, whereas the Brownsville Municipal Court represents the judicial branch of the city of Brownsville. The function of the Municipal Court is to pr process and adjudicate cases that are filed, including parking traffic and city ordinance violations and Class C misdemeanors. Whereas Municipal Courts play a significant role in preserving public safety and promoting quality of life in Texas, more people come into contact with municipal court than any other Texas courts combined, and public impression of the Texas judicial system is largely dependent upon the public's experience in municipal courts. Whereas procedures for the Brownsville Municipal Court operations are set forth in the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure and other laws of the state of Texas, and whereas the city of Brownsville is committed to the notion that our legal system is based on the principle that an independent, fair, and competent ju judiciary will interpret and apply the laws that govern us and that judges and court personnel should comply with the law as well and act in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. Now, therefore, we, the members of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville, Texas, by virtue of the authority vested in the charter, by the charter of said city, and on behalf of all of our citizens, do hereby designate November 4th through 8th, 2019, as Municipal Court Week, recognizing the accomplishments of Texas municipal courts and saluting their critical role in preserving public safety, protecting the quality of life in Texas communities, and deterring future criminal behavior done on this fifth day of November, 2019, signed by the members of the commission and city secretary. I want to thank you on behalf of uh, some of our staff here. I'm Judge Robert Devlin and this is Judge Bellamy. And our staff, some of them are doing more. Uh, there's about 30 members of our staff in the municipal court. And we do, like as Judge Meese, Predecessor explained to you in the resolution. We handle all of the court cases. In fact, we are the 
Thank you. And we we got in here and we have open house this week, so come by any day of the week. We'll be there all day. We have a nice table set up with little goodies and <laughs> coffee and stuff. And you can come by and visit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your work and your services. the public comment period. The person that signed up is Ms. Karen French. If you would please come up to the podium. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Karen French and our family lives in Rio del Sol. What's come to our attention lately is the new lighting that's being put up in Rio del Sol, which is a kind of very strong 4,000 Kelvin blue-white lighting. It's very cheap and harsh, and it's replacing the uh, old sodium pressure vapor lamps that are kind of a pinky gold. Um, these new lights are dangerous, and we want to see them stop being put up uh, just to have a uh, uh, a temporary embargo being uh, of replacing these very harsh, dangerous lights and just keep the sodium pressure vapor lamps until the city can buy lamps that are of much better quality. They don't cost much more, but they're, um, they're FLEDs or PC amber LEDs. And these are safe for animals and for people. The lights that are being put up now are extremely harsh and they're bad for people's eyes. I have eye disease, I have glaucoma. My husband has macular degeneration and cataracts and these lights shine in our eyes and cause us a lot of pain when we go on walks or go bicycling. I have to wear sunglasses at night <clears throat> to protect my eyes. It's also very bad for children. If they look at these lights, their retinas can be permanently damaged the damage that occurs to the retinas under these extremely strong LEDs, which are 4,000 Kelvin, uh, can cause permanent damage to these children and it's irreversible. And it also damages your eyes too. Um, there's no reason to have these extremely strong, cheap uh, lights that are 4,000 Kelvin. These are what uh, Walmart uses in their parking lots. It's not suitable for residential. Now I have copies of, uh, I should have made more copies, I'll bring more next time. Um, we have these um, phosphor converted amber LEDs and filtered LEDs. And these, are, these provide a warm white LED of 3000 Kelvin or less with a filter cutting out all blue light to less than one or two percent. And this is safe for humans and also makes it look so much nicer the way they have the streets lit down on uh, Des Moines and Calvary, Calgary Court and stuff on Rio del Sol, it looks horrible with the new lighting. It looks like a penitentiary. I feel like I should be down on my knees with my hands over my head, you know, I'm gonna be strip searched or something, or I'm, either that I, I need to have an appendectomy done under these lights. I could sit and read a newspaper or hem pants under these new lights, they're too strong. They're also very bad for birds. They're very confusing for birds. Um, birds get uh, diverted and confused. So um, anyway, I think my time's up, but I just wanted to, uh, to ask you not to put up any more of these extremely strong lights until you have a chance to look at alternatives, which don't cost any more. 
and the increase of quality of life in Rio del Sol and all over Brownsville. I want it all over Brownsville. I don't want these hard lights on Brownsville at all. Okay, Thank so you. I was going to give one copy to the city manager. Give, give it to the city yeah, secretary. Yeah, we, we got copies of that, actually. Okay. And, Thank you. Alan, you. you might talk I about our future talk. plans about some of the, uh, the LEDs. That the right, we, we are working with the public utility um, PUB here in Brownsville with regarding LED lights. I will convey this information um, to them so that we can maybe possibly relook at that street and look at the rollout of all the lights that we use because I understand the lumens and the light and it's, it, it, we, it's something that we do need to consider. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Mr. Stephen Bailey. If you would please come to the podium. Good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen R. Bailey and uh, today would have been my grandfather, Captain George W. Bailey's 99th birthday. Unfortunately, he passed at the age of 96 on February the 6th, 2017. Uh, I do appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me this evening, and the reason I had asked, requested to come forward is to express my concerns over the City of Brownsville Engineering Department. About a year ago to date, on November 15th, 2018, I submitted a street name request change on Coma Street, which is located in Olmito, under the, uh, I guess, under the uh, City of Brownsville jurisdiction. We fall on that fine line between Cameron County and City of Brownsville. Now, the purpose for my request was, one, in honor of my grandfather, of whom raised me since I was eight months old. To date, I just have my grandmother left. They moved here in 1975. He was a veteran of World War II, Korea, in which he retired from the U.S. Army. Then he worked for the Department of State and went to Vietnam where he met my grandmother. He adopted my mother at the age of two years old and brought them back to the United States uh, during the Vietnam War period. And uh, he started a sign business here in the city of Brownsville, actually in Olmito, uh, Bill Bailey Signs, in which he made numerous signs for the city of Brownsville uh, some of which include the City of Brownsville itself, Dean Porter Park, Lads <coughs> Porter Zoo, Brownsville Police Department, uh, numerous other venues, businesses, and so forth. And on the street itself, we're not talking about a major street. I understand there's another street uh, in question at the moment, but this street, my grandmother owns property on both sides of the street. We're the only residents on Coma Street in Olmito, Texas. Uh, there's only one house on the whole street. Uh, it stretches from the frontage road to old military 77 in which we own our residence which is on one side and we own the other side as well. And I had submitted this request to Mr. Eddie Santillan at the engineering department of city of Brownsville. And I have followed up with him every single month to no avail. And I keep getting the runaround. So I'm very dissatisfied with that. And Another reason for the request is there is already a Coma Street in Brownsville uh, in the southmost area. And a few years back when we needed 911 assistance for my grandfather when he was still living, the ambulance went to that address instead of ours, so it prolonged the care that my grandfather urgently needed at that time. So the request was to either rename the street Captain Bailey Street or Drive, uh, something to that effect, nothing too uh, exaggerated, but again, uh, my grandparents built their residence there in 1983. We've called it home. It's the only home I've ever lived in, the only home I know, and uh, I would just like that in memory of him to leave our mark in Olmito, where I grew up. Thank you. Thank you. Can somebody please make sure this is followed up on? Sure. I have his information. We'll definitely contact you after and review what was submitted initially. Thank right. You. Thank you, Thank so you Ms. Bailey. And also maybe if we could expedite it just in case their family needs assistance and is not able to receive it because it's dispatched to Southmost. Okay, we will look into it. Thanks. Next we have Mr. Jared Garcia. Okay. We'll move on to the next agenda. Next we have the work session, Greater Brownsville Incentives Corporation Economic Development Strategic Plan.
Good evening, Mayor, City Commission, Commissioners. What I have here in front of you is the uh, the GBIC strategic plan. It was adopted by uh, by the GBIC Board of Directors on September, um, excuse me, October 17 of this year, just just uh, recently, the last meeting actually. Some of you have seen most of this presentation, uh, yet when I first showed it to city management and to some of you, it wasn't yet adopted by the, by the new board. Now that we have a new board, we actually had our own work session, and now that the work session is over, uh, the last actual GBIC board meeting, uh, they adopted it at that time. So again, I'll start with, the, um, with our mission. As you know, GBIC's mission is to foster growth here in the city through business development efforts, recruitment, and promote an expansion and uh, retention of current businesses, and developing the environment for job creation and capital investment. If you were not aware, um, and, I'm, and I'm gonna guess it was around 2017, the JBIC board at that time approved the contracting of TIP strategies, TIP strategies, to, to uh, come to Brownsville and do different community forums and create a strategic plan and present it to the board at that time. Uh, this is the outcome of that particular contract, TIP strategies. During TIP strategies uh, um, recommendation here, you can see that there was five strategic goals listed there. And from the strategic goals, what we did is we broke it down into sub-targets. And on the far right of the presentation is activities that already have been conducted in alignment to those five goals. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over uh, each of the five uh, in, in, in this particular order so you can see uh, uh, what the board has, has uh, directed us to do. Again, this is a five-year plan, by the way. Uh, so by no means are we going to try to tackle everything in the five years, we're gonna phase it out in those five years, and I'll explain that as I go along. All this to say is that our hopes is that we can mitigate some of these targets, one of them being the per capita income here in Brownsville. We're thinking that if we do things right, uh, that we can improve the per capita income in Brownsville through job creation and, and increased uh, uh, job salaries. Uh, we will work with, and we have been working with, with city management on our land use strategy, uh, making sure that we are in alignment with the city's plan in, in that particular area. And we're creating a baseline in, in regards to workforce and education uh, and the collaboration thereof. Uh, we know that there's a gap in, in skilled workers. Uh, as you know, also we have some ma major projects coming not only here but in, uh, in uh, the Port of Brownsville. We're hoping that our citizens from our own backyard assume those high paid jobs and we wanna make sure we're ready for that. So again, going, with, going through those five targets, starting with the first one, workforce and education, uh, in, highlighted in yellow are the three major items that are recommended by TIP strategies. And in white text, you see items that we have already started. Uh, that we grow our own strategy, for example, and we'll, I'll cover that in the next slide. Jet grants, jobs and education for Texans, is, uh, is a grant that uh, will purchase advanced equipment for the schools. My understanding is that soon you'll hear BISD receive one of those grants, a little over 300,000, and we're working with TSC to also apply. It's for community colleges and ISDs, and we're working with TSC to apply for one of those as well. TIP is, uh, is a Texas uh, industry partnership grant. We're trying to work more with local industry and make sure that we partner in the right way so that we can help create um, the right pipeline for them. And uh, industry collaboration, you saw maybe hopefully in the media recently, we received two big manufacturing robots. Uh, it's, it's one of the examples that we'd like to create uh, and scale here with local business and asking them to uh, donate advanced equipment so then the schoolhouse can be used to help them prepare pipeline for the future. Um, skills development funding also, we're asking also Texas Workforce Commission to work with us in developing workers that are already employed and move them up in the, in the ladder in, in, in each industry that we have here. And also P-TECH strategies. P-TECH, uh, if you're familiar with dual credit classes at the ISD, I think we've done that in Texas for the last four years at least. If a student takes a dual credit class, it's typically around academia, typically dual credit math, science, history, and the like. P-TECH allows for dual credit in technology, and we think that that will help us move 
the pipeline a little bit faster, starting them earlier in high school. This is the We Grow Our Own. Uh, as you can see on the far left, we have our, our partners, and on the top, you have the continuum of our community. And what we did is we asked uh, the community to, to uh, work with us and collaborate with us and create larger partnerships so that we can uh, hit particular targets. Uh, the targets um, are around education and workforce development. So the ask is for industry partners to help us in this space, whether it's internships, teacher externships, uh, realign their scholarships accordingly based on our strategy, uh, give donations, open their doors for tours, uh, and open the doors for, for uh, career fairs and the like. So uh, uh, happy to say that since its inception, we've received a Texas Economic Development uh, Council's um, Workforce Excellence Award, so it's a state-recognized strategy. Um, it's community-driven and it's industry-led, and we hope that we create a larger pipeline so that we can have the, our own students assume the workforce of tomorrow, that I, as I call it. Really, really quickly, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Is there is there an apprenticeship uh, component to that as well? There is. So okay. the PTEC model allows for a, a high school student after the Texas um, labor law, which is 16. Uh -huh. to prepare them for an apprenticeship program. Yes, sir. Okay, who's the partner going to be on that? Because it looks like, I mean, all the industry you've identified here really do seem to be the major stakeholders, so it looks like some of these are going to have to step up because they're, they're not involved yet, right? Definitely, yes, okay. sir. So we actually had an industry-led forum last week okay. where we invited uh, our industry partners. We actually have uh, about 85 on our list, uh, and that's part of our business retention and expansion strategy to actually visit each one of these partners and ask them to join the – and, and – um, since that event, we've, uh, we've uh, received about 35 commitments from 35 different companies. And you're right. So typically, it was a big, the big players like Keppel and Tata and uh, CK. But since then, we've, we've acquired many more partners. And we're looking forward to expanding that partnership. Okay. Does um, that answer I, your question, sir? The question. Why are yes. all the boxes empty? So this is just a, a snapshot of an example. But currently, currently, we have over 30-some boxes filled. This is just not updated. This is and just which, under which category does health and wellness fall? In the adult layer, we, we, we've asked the current employers to, to uh, implement workforce strategies that allow their, their workers to be sustained long term um, and ask them to be in alignment with City of Brownsville's uh, uh, wellness programs. And we have had some success in some of those, and we can such report as, those out. Such as? Uh, CK Technologies, for example, asked their, asked, asked their uh, team members to, to participate in City of Brownsville's initiatives, and if they do, they, rec they, they acknowledge them in their, in their profiles, in their, in their um, performance evaluations, that they are uh, trying to sustain themselves as workers long term, and that's just one example. However, that particular, um, however, I would, I would very much recommend that these, these partners are encouraged not to just encourage their employees to participate, but they themselves yes, participate in small, medium, or large gifts that sustain our programs. It's, yes, it's very easy to say, okay, I'll tell my staff to do it, right. but they're not putting any skin in the game. Right. And that, that is something that's highly lacking. Definitely. We'll work on that, too. Thank you. Commissioner Gillespie, did you have Are any of the internships paid? The, the, uh, we're working on the internship strategy that will get them to a paid status after high school. So once, so, so right now they're in high school, and once we move them into, into, uh, into the TSC layer, the, uh, the third year, uh, we're working on, on paid internships. Yes, we are. So right we're not now, there do yet. you offer um, internships to people who are in college or, or um, a TSC? We've asked our, our, uh, our partners to consider realignment, realigning their scholarships that they have currently. Um, I asked them, I was like, where are the scholarships and where do those students go to? And typically, they don't know where those students go because they don't keep track of them. So I've asked them to realign that or rethink it to uh, create uh, strategies to where they move their scholarship to these programs like PTEC and allow those students to be paid as they go along. Uh, so that just we just started that conversation uh, about three, four months ago. Uh, we don't have any real results yet, but it's definitely on our plate. This is just one example uh, of PTEC. So there's two PTEC schools in Brownsville now. One of them is Porter that will focus on advanced manufacturing. The other one is HANA that would focus on medical uh, biomed. Uh, for example, there's 16, I believe, PTEC schools in Dallas. And there's only five, I believe, in Region 1. Two are here in Brownsville. So 
good for Brownsville to, and, and good on BISD to, to assume that leadership and create those two programs. And this is just an example of what it would look like. In the future, this could look like an uh, IT program, an energy program, in alignment with the port uh, projects. Could be an advanced construction program, uh, cybersecurity program, and the like. So PTEC allows for any of those types of programs. So right now, we just have two. Uh, BISD has agreed to look into having all their high schools um, and create PTEC programs as well. So in the space of business retention and expansion, P, uh, uh, TIP Strategies recommends these two particular bullets. Um, to be honest, GBIC is, is still fairly new after the BDC change, and we did not have a business and retention and expansion program. We do now. We actually hired one headcount to, to lead it, and that's Carla, she's sitting back here. And what we did is we identified uh, through, through um, different associations and the like here, including the chamber, what are all business partners that we have here that are aligning with a type A organization. And the strategy is to go and visit every single one and ask them questions like Commissioner just asked. Ask them these questions and then create the data and then find out where is the real gap and wh where do we need to uh, realign our narrative so that we can get these partners uh, and also to Commissioner Gowan's point is where, where is it that we need to focus in a little bit better? Right now we don't have all that data, but we're visiting all these partners and creating that data through a, uh, through a um, business survey. You can see a, uh, an example of the survey here. We ask them a lot of questions. This is just one page of it. Uh, and you can see a list that we have an actual list of all these partners we have to visit. So the strategy is to visit at least three to four per week and try to complete all of them by the end of the year. Here's one example again. Uh, here are BISD students. I actually went to CKIC Technologies. And what I like about this is they opened the doors over the summer for a teacher to come in as a teacher and extern and learn about what that business does so that they can translate it in the schoolhouse and make sure that the curriculum that they provide is in alignment with uh, current and real world industry needs. We'd like for this to happen across the board with many other industries, not just this one. Uh, target industry recruitment, again, these are, these are five areas that are recommended by TIP strategies. Uh, and we've, we're, to tell you, uh, Mayor, I believe you inquired about this particular meeting that we're having with BCIC and with City of Brownsville and GBIC together to make sure that we don't uh, overlap each other in these particular industries and that we stay in our lanes, that we're going to come up with an agreement of what is really uh, GBIC's niche and what should we stay in, in uh, lead and what is the support role, and same thing with BCAC, same thing with the city. So we've been working in, in that particular uh, area for the last two months, and we're hoping that we're able to report to the commission what the findings are in that and what the, what the uh, outcome will be. These are the five areas that are recommended by TIP strategies. Advanced industries, heavy industries, healthcare, food, beverage, retail, and hospitals. I think we've agreed that if it's really heavy industries, uh, the port should be considered and the like. So those are the kinds of conversations that we're having collectively between the city management, BCIC, and GBIC. Sites and infrastructure, uh, the three different areas that were recommended by TIP Strategies is protect existing uh, and future industrial sites, capitalize on, on potential with the airport, and you see that already happening through the city's initiatives, and strengthen GBIC's relationships with real estate communities. So uh, uh, we're also working with the city with an event I'm looking at uh, I don't remember the date, but we have a, an event with realtors, uh, investors, and brokers and the like to invite them to Brownsville and show them what's available at the airport, what's available downtown, what's available for industries, and, and hopefully get some leads from that particular event. Um, BCIC, the city, and GBIC are working together to have this event. Yeah, the event is November 19th. It's a broker's development tour. In fact, the mayor is going to give the welcome, and we're going to uh, highlight some of the sites available in Brownsville in, in, in coordination with our development partners. Right. Thank you. Better make sure it's on my calendar. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, that's just one, another with this, uh, tip strategy recommendation. Um, this one I received from the city management uh, is just an example of uh, from our industrial pie, what is GBIC's role? We're waiting and we're working with the city to figure out what is that target so that we can be in alignment to it. And uh, as you know, currently we have 5% land use uh, from a tax base perspective as industrial. Uh, we will wait for the city to tell us if that's, that's the target or is it going to be increased or what is it so that we can help be in alignment with it. 
you already know about this one. So we have some land available, working with the new GBIC board of directors to to uh, work together with what what are we going to do in terms of investment in this area, or do we just wait for for a customer? We're hoping that this particular event that's coming on November 19 gives us some leads so that we can help uh, this particular space. I've also presented this one before uh, that we this particular 65 or so acres has been stagnant for over 10 years. And we have some uh, LOIs, people are interested in developing it. Uh, I think one of them, I think lot seven, is the one that's probably further along, but we have other ones that are interested. Hopefully we're able to fill that up uh, sooner rather than later. And lastly is marketing and our image. Uh, the board also recommended that we rebrand GBEC and uh, invest a little bit more in our marketing and help the overall Brownsville strategy. And we'll also work with uh, BCAC and the city of Brownsville to make sure we're in alignment with the same narrative. And you'll see some of this in the, in the budget presentation, how this reflects the budget. So you can see in marketing, some of the things we've done is we're gonna launch a new, uh, a new quarterly newsletter, uh, relaunch a new website, we do industry spotlights here in this particular case. We spotlight a Greyhound and what they're doing here locally, because I think a lot of people don't know what some of our industries are, and we're trying to create more awareness with students to let them know what is available for them in their own backyard. We also agreed through the board that we will create a dashboard. This is just, this is not real data. It's just to show you that we have created a dashboard, and then with the board we will um, measure everything that we just presented from, from uh, recruiting to expansion to workforce to all these other things and how are we performing. <coughs> and based on this one, then we'll create a baseline. So then in year two, year three of tip strategies recommendation, we'll be able to adjust with, uh, after we collect this data through board's direction. Who's this gonna be available to? Is this an internal document then? It's an internal document, but definitely something we can make available in those meetings that, that you'll be participating in, Mayor, where the city, uh, the city and the BCIC are participating okay. so mm -hmm. that we can see. And then uh, we can also come and present this to commission as things develop so we can see where things are moving and where things are not so that we can adjust. I think it would be good to get a quarterly report of yes, some okay. sort from you if possible. Yes, and that's it. Basically, my uh, intent here was to present to you what the board has adopted as the GBIC's uh, strategic plan. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I would just like to voice, I'm concerned that you've done away with the internships previously when I was on the board, which is when you came along. Uh, GBIC was funding all in, which provided paid internships to college students and yes, was a benefit to the employers. And now you've completely done away with that. It seems to make more sense that you should you would offer that instead of eliminating it, and then just add the component for high schoolers. Yes, ma'am. I'm making a note of that. Actually, uh, that particular grant was to United Way. Mm -hmm. United Way made a request to terminate it because it did not complete the, the the performance of it last year, and this year they asked for them not to be renewed. Uh, my understanding is that United Way contracted TSC and. Um, UTRGV. Mm -hmm. So both of them were going to do internships, neither of which were completed, and United Way asked that they not continue the program. So it wasn't GBIC's request, it was United Way's request. Well, I know that they didn't seek for additional funding. To, uh, I don't know that it's that they decided to dissolve the program. I, I don't know, but we can look into it. Yes, ma'am. You may also want to look, uh, coordinate with TSC, with uh, Dr. Fleischman that was in the meeting we had this past week. Uh, the TSC Foundation has allocated a, a large amount of money for workforce stipends. So you may want to coordinate with that, yes, uh, see if maybe you can grab some of that money. Yes, because sir. it's really targeted to uh, emerging or in need uh, industry. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, And their success rate is, is 100% yes, right sir. now. Actually, the program that Commissioner Nerth just, just uh, referred to, uh, TSC still has funding left because it wasn't a completed program. So I asked them to freeze it okay. so that we can continue it, but now directly with TSC instead of through United Way. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have consent agenda items. We have a motion. So moved. moved. To we, have, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Next, we have public hearings. Public hearing number one, public hearing in action on resolution number 2019-092 to rename McNair Family Drive from Palm Boulevard to San Pearl Boulevard 
to East Fronton Street. Honorable Member Commissioners, uh, the slide before you is a. Uh, uh, can you, this is the next slide, can you show that, please? Uh, <clears throat> resolution number 2009 was approved on July 30th, which adopted an street naming policy. Um, the City of Brazil has received a petition to rename McNair Family Drive from East Fronton to Palm Boulevard. I mean, to rename East Fronton, to rename McNair Family Drive to East Fronton Street from Palm Boulevard to San Pedro Boulevard. Uh, the applicant's reasons for the name change include historical importance of the original Town South Street. The city did receive the application and has reviewed it for completeness. It is complete. Uh, uh, no less than 75% of owners abutting the subject street are required to make the change. Uh, based on the total of pro 78 property owners, this requires a minimum of 59 signatures. The applicant, the applicant has submitted 61 signatures in favor of the street name change which exceeds the minimum threshold of 75% of the property owners. Written notices of public hearing were sent via certified mail to owners of real property along McNair Family Drive as per official at Valorum Tax Roll. The first public notice of a public hearing was posted in the Brownsville Herald on Sunday, October 27th, 2019, and a second public notice of a public hearing was posted in Brownsville Herald on Sunday, November 3rd, 2019. Uh, on the afternoon of Monday, November 4th, 2019, the City Secretary's Office received a letter of support for maintaining the McNair Family Drive street name. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of what's happening. Have you gone and have you verified signatures on this? Because I, I know that there's... Yes. Uh, we, on the original application, we did, we did look at the signatures. It, they all had signatures. The original application back in June? No, the original application that, that, that was submitted for this, for this meeting. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Hernandez is another group of citizens uh, proposing to rename it to Fronton Street. Mm -hmm. uh, on Monday, we received a petition uh, from Mr. McNair with signatures in favor of maintaining McNair Drive. What's interesting on that is that some, some of the signatures on there, there's about six signatures on there that have, that are applicants who support it on the, on, the, on the application submitted Mr. Hernandez, there are signatures that are supporting the name change to Fronton, and now they're signing in favor of McNair. So it's kind of a... Uh, so we've noticed inconsistencies yes. in, in that, yeah. that came to us um, yesterday um, <clears throat> through that um, city secretary's petition request. And so um, the question is, do we want to go ahead and verify um, follow-up, staff can, is amenable, and I think city attorney concurs that one way to uh, review that and is to go back to those six or seven people that seem to have differing um, supports uh, and just verify that as part of this process. And so if staff is amenable to doing that, is that, is that is what the mayor and commission should, well, would like us to do. I, I want to get this right. And from the very beginning, we haven't been able to get it right. I know that it was difficult the first time because there wasn't a policy in place. And it was difficult for the commission because, you know, we, we relied on, on the employees, city employees, to kind of give us that representation that right. this is what, what they wanted, right? Um, so I, if there's a discrepancy, I want to make sure that those people, that you speak to them personally, right. and we figure out really where they are at. Because I noticed the first time, uh, this happened before I was on uh, on the commission. Yes. So I noticed the second time around that um, there was some people that were on both. Right. So I, I, I don't know why that needs to be figured out. Yes. And then I, I know that there's an issue as far as how do you actually designate who's a property owner and, and the percentages. So I think we need to nail that down as well. Yeah. I want to do the right thing. I want to make right. sure that everything's done properly though, because I don't want to do something and then have somebody come back the next meeting with with a different uh, signature, or a different story. Right. I would agree um, with uh, I would agree with everything our mayor just said. Um, another concern I have that I noticed is the way our policy was written is per house and not no, it's per property owner per, per property owner, per, per property owner. owner. So I right. didn't understand if that was if somebody owned three properties, do they get three votes? No. Or if somebody is renting and doesn't own a home in this area, do they are they still? entitled to a vote, although they may have lived there on that street for 20 years? Right. Well, that's another issue, because I don't know if you verified or whoever is in charge of verifying signatures, whether everybody that signed on there is the actual property owner and not a renter. Just please look at that as well. Yeah, we, we did go by the tax roll. As, okay. as per the tax roll, we, we, we contacted the property owner. 
And as per legal's interpretation of the document, of the policy, if you own 10 properties, you only get one, one signature. Uh, uh, the, way the, the way the item was written, it says mm -hmm. owners of properties abutting the, the street. So there may be 100 lots, but only 10 owners. Well, we don't have, we only have 10 votes. Uh, and uh, in looking as, into guidance on how to interpret that language, we were able to find a case right on point where uh, the statutory rules of construction in regards to interpreting contracts are the ones that are to be applied here. Uh, and every single word in the Genesis document is to be given meaning. So when it says 75% of owners, that's exactly what we must apply, exactly what it says. So um, I understand that there may be a situation where there's uh, an owner with multiple lots uh, because the policy is written, says owners of properties abutting uh, the street, and it's by owner, not by property. Okay. So um, I'm fairly confident that that would be uh, correct. Uh, and uh, that is my opinion, and I've, and I've given some guidance into the department in that regard. I know that there's, uh, you know, conflicting interests in regards to this issue, and, and those on the other side of my opinion may, may not be happy with it. However, I'm fairly confident that that, that, that is a correct interpretation. Okay. So I would agree. I think we have to be do it the right, do it right, and it mm -hmm. has been um, a bit confusing. But other than while you go back and verify all of that, which we already said, um, I would like to see some other options of how to honor or memorialize a particular family or business that has been very meaningful to the city, other than a just a street name, um, because I'm I'm wondering if there's other even bigger and better ways to do that as opposed to just argue about the name of the street. Definitely, we can look into that. I believe Parks may have some few, a few options, but we can, we can look into that further and provide options. Okay. My last question is Fronton. It's a very long street. So the renaming is only for a portion of it, or yes. is it for all of it? It's only east. From Palm, east. From Palm to San Pearl. Okay. Yes. Basically the eastern portion. Since we're going around the table saying opinions, um, <laughs> I realize that a, a lot of people here have been spending a lot of time coming to these meetings and getting together, getting everyone mobilized. For that reason, I would ask if any of the people, who, property owners whose names have been on both lists, maybe you're here and you could say which one your preference is just so that we could move things along. I, um, I, 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 I understand that, Commissioner, but I don't know if we have all seven names and if they're all here, that, that yeah, can have, create an issue. I, I mean, if they're here, I, I don't have a problem. But. Uh, and not only that, maybe some do not feel comfortable standing um, up, standing standing up and up. stating that. I would yeah. say for their, uh, 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 you know, we don't in, in a way. Cars keyed. <laughs> and believe me, I want to do this as soon as possible, but I want to do it the right way because right. my dad used to always say haste makes waste. So I don't want to do this hastily. I don't want to do it sloppy. It, we've already done enough of that up to now. So I want to get it right. I would make a motion to table. I'll second that. We have a motion to table and a second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Was it, a, are we tabling, because it's public comment. Oh, oh I forgot. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. No, Hold on, right. this, this is not a public hearing, yeah. but it everyone is. has an opportunity. Yeah. Everyone has an opportunity to comment. Um, it yeah, it is a public, it is a public um, hearing. Um, well, it, it is a public hearing, so I guess we could open it for public uh, well, hearing open. if, if the commission is open. You're right. So You're right. Yep. So what do we do about that vote? Do I, do just, I withdraw my motion? Withdraw, and I'll withdraw my motion. That's fine, but oh. just for the residents that are out there, you guys want to talk today, not a problem, but we're very likely going to end up tabling it. If you want to talk this this meeting, next meeting, whatever, but you're here, so you want to do it? Yeah, let's yes, go. Sir. Renee, do I need to remove my uh, I think motion? that would be appropriate. I would withdraw my motion. Okay. I'll withdraw my second. All right. I'll withdraw my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Please state your name. Yeah, hello. My name is Juan Rene Hernandez, and I'm a property owner of 430 East Fronton Street. So basically, um, uh, I'm here as a property owner, and uh, the voice of other property owners of East Fronton Street uh, who who are present and those who couldn't attend. Whereas as taxpayers, property owners, we come before you to request that our historical street be changed back to its original name. We're not here to question your guidelines or city policies to change or rename streets within the city boundaries, but rather we are here because we have met all the requirements requested. You guys set up the requirements, 75%, we got all of that. So now you're, I mean, we're being told that 
I mean, the only thing in question is those six residents, but even then we still got more than 75% of the, of the people, of the residents in favor of the name change. The issue is going to be those seven, those seven, if they're on the other side as was done on Monday, then they knock off your 75%. That's why I want to get this right. But mm -hmm. continue. On, uh, yeah, so we strongly believe that the U of the City of Brazil or the City Commission had more information on hand or had done the proper due diligence back in June, the change, or in May, the, the change would never have happened. So upon learning of the decision, we requested the reversal of the, of the decision on August 6, on August 6, 2019, the decision to change the name back to East Fronton Street was denied. We were told to follow the new guidelines established on the same date of August 6 to get our street name back, which we have. We've met all the requirements, like I just mentioned, imposed to us by the new guidelines. We have 77% of the property owners in favor of the name change out of the 75% required. So what the process we did is we first sent, went door to door to reach property on East Fronton Street. We visited the owners who lived in a different part of the town. A mail that was done for owners who lived in different cities. Uh, or even countries, in August 19, we sent out a second mail out, but this time we sent it out a certified mail with, with the petition to request signature in support of changing the name back to East Fronton Street. On August 19th, we sent a third mail out as well certified. So, I mean, at the end, we were able to get the 50 signatures exceeding the 48 threshold for, or uh, for the 75% 75, 75 required by the city. Um, we also mailed out a, a certified letter to the Brownsville Historic Association asking for their support as it is a historical city or a city that's been here for 169 years, almost 170. But unfortunately, they failed to respond, so we conclude they don't support our cause. But, so, um, so we're just here for the residents, commercial, and property owners of uh, East Fronton Street. Uh, East Fronton Street means pride, their neighborhood, their home. Some have lived on East Front Throne for generations and will continue to do so. The fact that 77% of the current property owners want the name of their street, East Front Throne, back. Um, and then just the historical importance of the street, like I mentioned, 169. Um, East, East Front Throne Street predates Brownsville, when a river ford located in El Ramireño was used by locals to cross the Rio Grande River to travel to Point Isabel, which was originally named El Fronton de Santa Ibel. So I believe that's where we get the name Fronton, or Fronton for short, which was used as a summer resort. Um, and the street has played an important role since the 1900s for the development and growth of the city of Bronzeville. It was an industrial warehouse district from the 1900s to the 1990s. Um, part of the Afro-American and Afro-Mexican community lived there during the 1800s up to the 1970s. East Fronton Street history was used to designate the freight depot and warehouse district in the city of Brownsville. So like the new district that was just recently named or we got awarded national recognition, I believe, or state recognition. Um, East Fronton is part of it. So it's kind of odd to name, rename uh, a street that's been here for a while to a family who's been here a while too, I guess, but uh, not as long as the city of Brownsville. So, and then just basically the will and desire of the current property owners and residents. Um, for the sentimental value and memories of past, present, and future generations that have called the street home. For the preservation of the history of the city of Brownsville. And, uh, and I believe East Front Don Street is protected by Ordinance 2015-1606, which replaced the old ordinance adopted by the city in 1971. The new ordinance objective is to the historic preservation of the city of Brownsville and from Stone Street Falls within its statement of purpose, section one, uh, section being uh, to strengthen the economy of the city, to strengthen the civic pride through neighborhood preservation, and to promote the use of historic resources for culture, prosperity, education, enjoyment, and the general welfare of the people and of the city visitors of Brownsville. Uh, and then this last fact can be found in the city of Brownsville website. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for doing the job of coordinating room, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, you've done a good job on that. Thanks. <clears throat> I've been coming to these meetings for 12 years. This is not the first time I've seen this issue. Please state uh, your name for the oh, record. Oh, Brad Burks, Brownsville. <laughs> 
Uh, it's not the first time I've seen this issue. Uh, when the idea of renaming a street first comes up, everybody's excited about, the, the ones that are pushing it are excited about who they're going to honor. Every time they are surprised that there's a huge backlash against it. But think about what happens when you rename somebody's street. It's like you're coming into their house and changing their life without their permission. So it's different than changing the name of a park. It's different than, than naming something in the first place. So the anger that comes against the, the renaming uh, basically is uh, it's dishonoring the person that you intended to honor in the first place. We're, we're a growing city. There's going to be new streets that we can honor people with. Uh, I know a lot of the names are, are uh, are named, uh, none of the streets are named by the developers. Uh, some, maybe someone can suggest names to those developers when that's happening. But uh, when you rename a street, it adds confusion. Uh, everyone on that street, now, now their life has been changed. Uh, I still get mail from the people that lived in the house I'm in 20 years ago. I, I mean, uh, confusion happens. Uh, the post office does their best, but it, not all the mail gets forwarded. We heard about... Uh, uh, problems with ambulances getting somewhere. Now, now, when you're talking about a street like Mr. Bailey's where there's only one house, that's a different situation. But uh, you, you look at the situation with Coffee Port Drive. Uh, I was here when they did that. I was going to mention that a little while ago. That was a very, a very similar situation that occurred in District 2. It was before my time, and the ultimate resolution was half is Coffee Port because half of it was named after somebody named Coffee who had passed away, but his family still exists. Yes. So it was half Jaime Zapata, half Coffee Port. And so that confusion. Was the uh, we, we, just, we just coffee. made it, we yeah. made coffee, it very confusing. Coffee Port, Jaime Zapata. Yes. So uh, the the Coffee it. family donated that land for the road to the port, as I understand yes. it. And they did not do their due diligence to find that out before they decided to rename the street. Nobody so, assumed it was, a, so now you was have, a person named Coffee. Yes. You have, uh, I, I'm sure there's, uh, it, Obviously, Jaime Zapata is someone that we should honor. Absolutely. But let, let's give him a whole street somewhere when we have a new street. Uh, you look at uh, Dr. Hugh Emerson Drive. So if you're going to give someone directions into Brownsville to Dr. Hugh Emerson Drive, it goes like this. You're coming south on the inter expressway, uh, exit Alton Glore, take a left, and you come to Paredes Line Boulevard where the, the street will change names to Dr. Hugh Emerson Drive, which used to be uh, El Hardin Drive. I mean, it, you've got that whole explanation to get them where it was. And so every time we do this, we're, we're adding confusion. We're uh, giving people a reason to be upset and dishonor the person that you really want to honor in the first place. And so that that's my little take on it. And uh, so I, I would suggest we make it uh, very difficult to rename a street. When you're talking about new streets, yeah, let, let's honor these people with new streets when that happens. But th anyway. Thank you. Thank well. you. Completely off topic. God bless you. Completely off topic. In our uh, policy naming um, policy, <laughs> our street naming policy, is there something that would um, cover families like the gentleman who spoke, um, the Bailey family, um, where they live on a street that's duplicated because we have a lot of area in our ETJ and let's say that we annex like we did into Old Mito and there are two streets that have that name. In our street naming policy, is there something that would protect because if not we would need to add it? Well the street naming policy is routed to the, when there's a petition for a proposal it is routed to different agencies. For example the fire department or police department had a concern with duplication of, of names then that would, when that when that technical analysis is done by each department, that would come out in that request. Okay. So we do have a process incorporating okay. existing policy. Just Thank slip you. through on that one. Okay. Thanks. Yes, sir. Please yeah. uh, tell us your name. Ernesto Hernandez, Chapa, and I'm a, I'm a property owner at Port 30s from Tone Street. And um, I've, been, I've been asked by, this, by the property owners uh, of from Tone Street to spearhead the application uh, to rename our street back to East from Tone Street. I'm not here, I'm not, this is not my, uh, my argument is not about uh, renaming, but the way the procedure is following because uh, like Mr. Lastra said, uh, he was unable to confirm 
he had plenty of time to confirm the names of the signatures because the phone numbers and their mobile phone numbers are on the petition that we submitted with our application. So uh, we had, what, uh, two weeks, three weeks? We met with Mr. Lastra, and he didn't bring this up. And, and, and again, uh, uh, and again, uh, we, were, we were fulfilling the requirements for an application to bring this matter to your vote, okay? So therefore, uh, if, if there was something wrong, they should have, they should have uh, uh, pr proved or verified the signatures before they even brought it to you, before they even brought it before you. So why are we bringing it back again, okay, when they had plenty of time to do that, okay? Now, if Mr. McNair wants to uh, rebuttal or <clears throat> argue about your policies like he did in the newspaper today, then I think he, he should file an application and pay $500 like we did in order for him to come and, and uh, submit his argument uh, before you. Therefore, again, uh, he kept my, he, you kept my, my original uh, file. We could, have, we could have verified those signatures before we came here today. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, just questioning, so we, we, I'm, I'm just questioning your procedure and the way you do the procedures because, be, because, because we went through this plenty of times. You asked me to, they asked us to verify certain signatures on that, on, the, on that application, four, five, or six, or seven, they asked us to provide documentation and proof of, on proof of signatures and ownerships of the properties. And then, and then again, we have, this, we have this argument again. So, okay, so what's happening? Mary, if I may address that question. What the deal is. Uh, if I may address that question, huh? the problem is, and you know, uh, with, with respect to the hard work that has been put in by the engineering uh -huh. department, Seven of the signatures on your petition to uh, to change the name are now also on the petition to keep the name. On another so, petition. So other that's than, that's what correct. I'm so right? on, in, in, it's a to different give, petition. I understand, but in order to give uh, the true consent of the people, because we could just the city could have taken a stance where they would just reject your petition based on the change of heart or revocation by those subsequent signatures. However, the city has not done that. The okay. city wants to make sure that we get those uh, signatories true intent uh, to make sure that, as the mayor says, that we do this right. And, and I think the city is just trying to do the right thing. And that's been the whole issue is the process, and I agree with you on that. I'm trying to get this right, and I don't want, I don't want to have to yeah, come back Yeah, we, we've been trying to get this right also, and we did everything that you asked for. And, uh, and we sent not only one uh, mail out, but two mail outs, and two were certified. There was plenty of time. Now all of a sudden we get signatures and we don't know who they are, but we're, we're more than happy to go back and find out exactly. what happened. Okay, uh, people are, uh, they have the right to change their minds, but we, we have to find out what happened. We don't know who they are. I agree with you, sir. We just want, we should have, we should have had at least the, the, the courtesy of the, him, to, of the, the city telling us uh, that this was going on so we can verify, so we can bring it up when. I don't disagree with you, sir. Yeah? Thanks, thanks for coming up. Thank you. Thanks. May I ask a question to the city attorney? Um, the policy, does it provide for a, a, for a counter to a petition to change the street name? It does not, and it was not counted as a petition, Commissioner. Uh, what we were concerned with was the fact that the signatures attached to it could be considered a revocation of the prior signatures, which would create a problem with the count on the original petition. So. Uh, we were just trying to do our due diligence uh, just to make sure that uh, those seven signatures that may or may not be in question, uh, that their true intent is, fo is followed. So those duplicate signatures, though, those are in the petition for the name change back in May? Or uh, is it a more recent petition to, pe to keep the name as McNair Family Drive? Those, those signatures were turning to the city yesterday at 4 o'clock. And, and what's the title of that list? It was a petition to keep the name. Um, because there's no procedure for anyone to file uh, such a petition, uh, that petition was not considered as a petition to keep the name. What we were concerned with was the signatures that were attached, to make sure that those signatures were not in revocation of those signatures in the original petition. But my concern is that if the city policy doesn't provide for a counter to a, a petition to maintain the, current, the existing name, 
then we really can't even consider that. Well, the problem is not that simple, Commissioner, because one of the issues that we had was that those signatures, at least a few, a few of them, did not match. So there could be an element of fraud. So uh, we, again, we no just want to certify. To, to submit the rebuttal of the other signatures where were, which were already verified. They wouldn't be coming before the commission if they hadn't been verified. And there's well, no procedure to rebut it. I, I, and and y'all have allowed this so-called petition to come in to rebut the properly executed petition of these citizens. Correct. Commissioner, our concern was the signatures weren't matching. So there may have been an element of fraud. We just want to make sure that we do the right thing. Um, now, uh, you all don't have to follow that road. If you all choose not to table uh, and believe in the process that's it's been done today, you have the last voice and the last uh, the last say in this matter. If you choose not to table and go forward with the petition, that's one of your options. And, and Council, just to verify, the signatures are not, they don't match, right? There are some signatures that do not match, okay. which was what brought our concern you mean that they to don't verify. match in the they're way the they're same. written, or they don't match on each, each of the petitions? I mean, we have the name of the property owner and two completely inconsistent uh, signatures. So we don't know which right. could be the right one. So that's a problem. also it's important to note. Okay, but we have already one petition that's verified, and those signatures are verified. Uh, it is, the, the city has determined that that's a bio petition, that's why it's here before you okay. all. So now, these uncomplying signatures are the ones that are different than the ones on the verified petition shouldn't be considered. But well, we don't know which one, the, which one is the true and correct one. Well, the now, one that they verified. Well, uh, they've been verified that that is the owner of the property, uh, and the signature is the only one that we had on, on base. Now, they did check uh, with other databases to see if those signatures were correct, uh, uh, Commissioner. They have properly verified that petition. One of your choices today here is not to table the item and move forward with the vote. So if the signatures don't match, then that means one of them would have been forged. Could be, correct? yes. Well, right. Is that where you're going or with? Or like the husband signed for the wife, and the or wife it could be know, done under authority, the which is something they the want to verify. I think it's important also to look at it this way: if there are two conflicting signatures, the commission would be obligated to void the signature altogether. No. Well, that would be the easy route, and just knock those seven signatures signatures out. But then that would also knock out all their hard work. So and that's the, why it's important so to verify. So we to don't verify knock out your petition to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Yes, sir. Come on up. Just tell us your name, please. You got uh, three minutes. All I need is one. All right. <laughs> I'm uh, Matthew Ivan Castaneda, son of Felipe Quiclava Castaneda. He was a Vietnam veteran. My mother was a nurse and a teacher. They did charity work. They helped with the community a lot. I want to do the same. I recognize faces up here. You guys are doing an amazing job. I'm one of the signatures that signed for both. Ask me why. McNair's my neighbor. He came up to him one day very mad. What do you think I'm going to do in a millionaire? comes up to me, a property owner. I'm scared, I'm shaking. I'm against the name change. I love the name Fronton. If you want something else, you can have it. McNair's actually my friend. I'm real, you know, he calls me on the phone. Hey, is everything good? Yes, yes, yeah. thank you, McNair, for caring about us citizens. So I'm not opposed to naming something else, McNair. That'd be amazing. But let's keep Fronton. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having the courage to come up. That was less than a minute, by the way. <laughs> I'll take it. Good, good evening. Um, my name is Bill Berg. I live on um, West St. Charles Street now. And one of my fears is that at some point in the not too distant future, somebody will want to name it West St. Trump Street and <laughs> everything will or change. Berg. That'll never happen. <laughs> I don't don't give anybody answer. any ideas, Bill. <laughs> yeah, don't bring that before us. What, what Re Reverend Burke uh, brought up earlier and, and, and was discussed earlier by um, uh, Commissioner Tetro about renaming streets creates tremendous disruption. And there aren't that many streets in Brownsville. I lived in a town, not a city, it was a city, where during Vietnam War, where Everybody wanted to rename something. And what they named in that town, actually they had been doing it since World War I. Fallen heroes got 
intersections named after them did not change any street names under the sign that said uh, Second Street this this way and First Avenue that way. There was another street which said uh, McCormick Square or something like that. Perhaps we could take the corner of East Fronton and Sixth and name it McNair Square. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks. in opposition to the petition to change the name. Uh, I'm going to bring up something that I think uh, hasn't been brought up, but it's the methodology that's been used to count up the votes, so to speak. Uh, the petitioner's is, the application is based on ownership. So you get one property that has two owners, or maybe there's six owners because the parents died and left six children. Uh, so they would get six votes, or two votes, other than one. If it's on the tax roll in the wife's name only, it's one of them. You get one owner that has 30 lots. Yeah, Michelle, um, sorry, Michelle, just when you're going to talk, just get behind the mic so we can pick it up, please. Okay. the policy or change the way it is. That's, that's it's, You have to play by the rules. The rules have been set. You need to play by the rules. All I'm saying is, okay, if you Google street renaming policy, the third the third entry on Google is the, the city of Greenville, Tex, Greenville, Texas, which is north of Dallas. And our ordinance is, our policy is verbatim copied from the city of Greenville. They did change the name council to commission. Uh, you call the city secretary of Greenville and ask her how they count the votes. Well, it's one lot per vote, one vote per lot, period. I mean, no question asked. And you can verify the number of lots from the CAD. Second method is to go by the number of CAD accounts, which you can also verify on the CAD. You've got in, in the sheet with the numbers spells it out. Under the number of lots, there's 139 lots. Under the CAD account method, there's 86. Under the petitioner's method with owners, there's 80 to 82. So the percentages change when you're taking 75% of different numbers. Uh, the only one that works for the petitioners is using owners. All right, so they've counted one owner owning 30 lots is one vote. And two owners owning one lot is two votes. Now that, I mean, it should be one lot per vote, or one vote per lot. That's, that's the number of lots affected by the change, and that's how the percentage should be applied. So it's my contention that the policy is apparently vague, since it's being interpreted to count owners only as opposed to lots or CAD account numbers. Ownership. Michelle, you're out of time, but I'm going to give you a little bit more because of the Okay, ownership of a lot can only really be determined by a title search. Okay, this is a question of the policy, though. That's not what, how the agenda item is written. I understand. Just, given, the law, the, uh, given the policy that was adopted, we're supposed to decide on that. You're asking us to, to address a completely different issue. I'm asking you to interpret the policy because there's different ways of counting the votes. You're and asking that's, us to change the, po the policy. Really what it's going to come down to is the interpretation of the policy and how that works. That's, a, that's the key question. And I that's a policy totally decision that the commissioners need to make because it's our contention that the votes are not being counted justly. You're, you're disenfranchising the majority of the lot owners. And that's something that, Council, you're going to have to give us an opinion on that. Well, he did. Mayor, well, I think I have. I think, a, I, I, think I have. The, it's clear. Uh, right. yeah, like like uh, Ms. Sanchez is saying, the only way this works for all these people is if we count owners. But that's exactly what's written in the policy. It's well, we're going to have to do 5% of owners of properties up on the street. I mean, that's exactly what it says. Are that is my best opinion. We just have to, you know, strictly construe the, the policy as written. And if you have case on that, just I'll be happy to he, just get it to us. That's all. Said he had a case, and right. it's construction rules. Mm -hmm. And the construction rules give each word their meaning. 
and the meaning as he interpreted and gave his legal opinion is owners, mm -hmm. not lot. But, but you see what problems you're having trying to determine who the owners are. Well, I, and I don't see and, the, and that's the, not a static issue. The ordinance that you're referring to from Greenville or wherever, I don't see it here to be able to compare and make sure it says the same thing. You don't need to see yeah. it. Look at your own ordinance. It's identical. Well, I like, well how do we know it's identical? That's what I'm okay, pointing well, out. Okay, well, city so, staff can verify it. I mean, I don't even know who drafted, quote, drafted the ordinance. And I, I'm not, I, I would mean, think city copying attorney, another ordinance that works is not a problem. It's just, it's, it's just when you call that city and say, how do you apply it? And they say, we go by one lot per, one vote per lot. Mm -hmm. That's their interpretation, I guess. So, and that's their interpretation. I got you. And, and I'm just saying, we don't, we're seem to be focused on ownership and the numbers of owners and if they are the true owners or not the true owners and if there's a husband or a wife that signed or didn't sign. And you would avoid a lot of that if you just went strictly by lot count or cat account uh, numbers. I understand. Thanks. I, I would say that the staff did look at the Cameron County Appraisal District, so the property owners were determined through them. Yeah, I if mean, that's it, the title owner of the property, I get it. If, no. If a corporation owns a lot, is it everybody in the corporation that gets a vote? So you're saying CAD is not, I'm doesn't saying reflect the, the title I'm saying the least reliable information on CAD is the ownership, because ownership is not static. They certify their roles on July 15th of each year to gotcha. the taxing agencies and they set the ownership on that date. So anything that happens after July to December 31st is not reflected on CAD. CAD also doesn't reflect if somebody has died and left six kids that now own the lot. I understand. So, okay, so it's the least reliable information you can get well, on CAD. It's, it's not up to date is what you're saying? It's not up to date? It's, not, it's just it not reliable. It's not a title search. They just, they just go what they see on the deeds, and, and they, Did, don't, they don't know if there's a probate, if there's a, a death. Uh, Council, how uh, how up to date is the data? How up to date is is the um, the search done by the city as far as to determine ownership? Do we know that? There's two methods. The, it looks like the way that it was written and the policy uh -huh. it says owners as determined by CAD. Uh, oh, so wow. okay. that's what we did. So I mean that is exactly how the policy was written. It was not written by myself. It was written by the department. I was called on to interpret what the language meant, and I think I did my best opinion. Now, I understand you disagree with that. We've had a conversation about this. Right. Uh, and I gave you case law that you thought was confusing, but that is the best, uh, uh, the I, best uh, resource that I could have on something that is right on point. If Thank you're you. trying, to, if, you're, if you're trying to cut down on the number of, of street name requests, cha name change requests, it seems like you want to increase the level, the bar, and mm -hmm. make it harder, right. not easier. Right. So 75 is a pretty high bar. Uh, the highest we saw in looking at, at the various statutes around the country was 90. The lowest was 50. But if you're going to take 75 percent of owners, conversation yeah. to take place, it's off of the agenda. I'm going to be the parliamentarian well, out. Well, but also when you're engaging them as well, that kind of cuts into their time. They have to respond to stuff you're saying too. So it I'm, works I'm both ways. I'm just trying to cut to the, to I get the methodology. You. Thanks, is Michelle. what I'm trying to get to. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hold on, you don't talk from the audience. If you're going to talk, you come up here. But you already spoke, you're out of time. So, sorry. Who else? Absolutely, come on up. Just tell us your name, please. Ernesto Hernandez, Jr. Okay, um, well, I don't know what my father wants to say, but. Um, I'm not as good as public speaking as you're right. But um, what I want to say is, last time we came here, we weren't able to change the name because there was a policy in place already, right? Your attorney right now is saying that, uh, well, the attorney of the city and not your attorney, um, is telling us that, let me put it into words. Last time they told us that we couldn't change the name because there was already policy in place. He already suggested the way it was interpreted right now, presently, and we followed your procedure. Someone else is trying to convince the council to interpret it a different way, so that's a, that should be on a different agenda. We're following the interpretations that the attorney cost suggested, you know? So according to that interpretation, we've met all the requirements. Now the question is, can we verify those signatures? Now my question is, you announced a public hearing. Where are those people to come in here and make the comment that they're opposing the name change? You got all these people 
that are in favor of the name change back to Fronton Street. You know, it's just, there's a lot of inconsistency, inconsistencies here, and it only seems like the only people that are taken advantage of are the residents of Fronton Street. That's just my comment, okay? Thank you. Anybody else? Is that all? Okay. Motion to close public hearing. We have a motion to close. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. Okay. Do I have a motion? Motion to table. We have a motion to table. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Okay. Pass. Um, and if so I can just table. add one more comment. All of us, I think, have already made up our mind. It's just a matter of the procedure. They want to do it. Um, make sure that there, we don't open ourselves up to liability. But I think all of us on, at this table have made up our mind. I agree with it's that. not that it's going to change. I so I, right. I kind of, that's why I, I feel your frustration that it's taking even longer. Because I, I, I feel it too. And we so. can't ignore that six people, you know, are voting both ways. We need to determine what their true intent is. And I would say that you should not be intimidated by anyone. Yes. No one should be able to intimidate you, and you should determine if there has been some forgery of your name uh, as well. Right. I would encourage you to do that, and don't be intimidated about what you really want to do. Exactly. And All thank right, so you for coming. Thank you. Absolutely. So thanks. Um, it's the hearing or the action is tabled. Next item. Public hearing number two. Public hearing and action on first reading on ordinance number 2019-933-PP to amend Article 4, Classification Plan Section 11-71A, Classes and Positions of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Brownsville, Texas, by establishing new classes, positions, and number of employees in the fire and police departments. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Commissioners. The Brownsville Fire Department is requesting approval to amend Ordinance 2019-933, double PP. The changes will reflect the increase in number of firefighters from 107 to 122 in order to hire the firefighter positions awarded through the SAFER grant. The approval will assist in bringing much needed personnel, helping alleviate current overtime costs reducing burnout amongst firefighters, and providing for continued safe manning of fire apparatus for our firefighters and our citizens. Leadership is committed to ensure that the 15 new firefighter positions are sustained past the three years of the grant. Is that it? That's it. Okay, My, um, is there anybody else on this item? Okay, um, I had an issue. So you're asking us to, to go ahead and, con and continue the same amount going forward after the grant's over, right? That's correct. Is that something that's required by the grant itself? It is not required by the grant, no. Okay. Do we know what the fiscal impact is going to be on that uh, past year three? I mean, I understand what you're saying. I just, number one, I don't, it's not required, so I'm not sure if it's necessary for us to do that now. Okay. And then I don't know if we have, because what we're going to do is we're basically committing to the same number past year three, and um, I just don't know what that's going to cost us. I have no clue. So I'm assuming somebody from the city has that information. and. I'm hesitant to commit ourselves past year three if we don't have to. How much, um, how much was the grant for? Do we know? It, um, I don't have the, the current number. I think it was one point something, one point two. One point one, 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 one million, one million, one hundred and thirty six thousand eight hundred and six and fifty cents. A year or? No, that's over the course of three years. Over okay, three years. Okay, so basically it's probably going to cost us. Three fifty four hundred Divided maybe. by three. And then if you do CBA and other stuff in there, Correct. aggregate that going forward. Plus overtime. <laughs> right. So we're looking at an additional three, uh, four to five hundred probably per year ballpark. Correct. Helen, has staff looked at the cost and are, is, are, is management recommending this? I didn't see any recommendation in the packet. There was no. Okay. Well, actually, there was. Yes, there was. Yes, we're working together with the fire department and, and reaching out to resources through ICMA to develop a staffing model, and we'll be presenting that. Okay. My question is, why are we doing this three years ahead of time? Three years ahead of time? 
Yeah, this is commitment past year three. That's so correct. we have a grant for three years. Yes. We have an initial 15 firefighters every year for three years under a grant. That's what correct. What this is asking is that we continue to have those 15 on board, which I don't have necessarily a yes. problem with, but I just don't know why we're doing it now, three years ahead. I, I, I don't see the purpose. The, the reason we're asking for the increase in, in staffing is that we cannot preemptively hire those 15 without oh. the change in ordinance. And now, then okay, that's what I was asking if it was required. Correct. So <laughs> the, the ordinance, we can't hire past the ordinance number. So preemptively, we cannot hire those 15 firefighters up until the ordinance is increased to meet those new 15 firefighter positions. So, so you were able to go out and get the grant without the ordinance being in place? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Because also I guess people would retire and... But what is the, what is the request for the ordinance though? Because the way I understood it is we're committing to continuing to employ these past year three. That's, that's why I'm wondering why we're here. But if you're saying it's required for the grant, that's a different story. I didn't see that in the packet and I asked you earlier and you said no. Right. It's, it's not required by the grant. It's required for the hiring process by the ordinance. Okay. So that's why we're requesting an amendment of the ordinance to increase the number of staffing from 107 firefighters to 122. That would allow the hiring of the 15 firefighters as per the grant. And civil service does require it. Requires well. that we have the exact to amount. To identify the number of, of positions available. available. We can't. We, so to currently hire. Right, so we cannot hire without those positions actually being available by civil service. We're going from how many to how many? From 105. 107 by, to 122 firefighter positions. Okay. So it's just a 15. 15. It's a 15. Correct. And what if you need? What if you decide you need more? We have to change it again. That yes, that, that's been done before. If, if we, through a staffing model, determine we need more firefighters, then that would go through commission and and uh, ordinance change once again. So why and we if just we needed, overshoot? If we needed less, we would also amend it to to reduce that amount. How often does this occur? I mean, my inclination is to overshoot. Instead of 122, we go to 130 if, or if, something. Then we, we would have to come if back. If we overshoot, as per civil service, we have to hire the mm -hmm. allotted positions. So, so we then cannot civil, have positions. civil service then requires for you to have the exact amount exactly. of positions. Correct. Wow. Okay. Is this a public hearing? A yes, public? it is. Do we have anybody else here on this? Motion to close public hearing. Second. Oh. Are you good? We have a motion and a second. Okay. <laughs> Uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, do I have any motions? Motion approved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Motion passed. Thanks. Next, we have items for individual consideration. Action item number three, consideration action to approve the Greater Brownsville Incentives Corporation budget, fiscal year 2020 budget. Mayor, City Commission, I believe you have some material in front of you regarding this item. This particular budget was uh, approved by the JBIC board on 17 October, which is the last JBIC board meeting. I'll also mention that prior to that particular meeting, we had several uh, work sessions to discuss the whole budget, and it was finally approved uh, on that particular date. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go over um, nine different items or nine different areas of the budget, starting with personnel and services. The personnel services budget did not change from prior budget. Um, a lot of it has to do with three different, three different positions, three different vacancies that haven't been filled uh, since I've been here. And, uh, so I uh, need approval from the, from the board to move forward. However, um, it reflects three positions that are not filled. Three? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you have five now? You have five employees now? We have four. Okay. I'm sorry, yes, five. Okay, yes, and I'm you've got two that are vacant, right? Yes. Okay, that's what I understood. Yes. Because right. right here on most of your stuff it says personnel what? seven. What it is is uh, we we went from eight to seven. Okay. So I, I guess my point was that it's it's uh, this particular budget didn't change from the year before, and that we saved that money. So that money is still in in the JBIC budget, and the board requested that.
We still have it manned for eight, however, only budget for those seven, as you, meant, as you, as you pointed out. Materials and supplies, this particular one, this particular one did not change either. There was, um, I think I went, okay, yeah. Did not change either. Um, and also, not all of this budget was used last year. The majority of it, over 50% of it, reflects furniture that is not owned by GBIC in the Young House. So there's a lot of furniture in there that doesn't belong to GBIC. So this particular budget item has been as such in the event that in the future there's some move or something and there's a requirement to buy furniture. Okay, I was wondering because you had quite a, bit, a pretty high amount for furniture. But again, uh, my understanding has never been used completely. It's just the fact that most of the furniture in the Young House does not belong to GBIC. So when we acquired the Young House, UTRGV had been mm -hmm. leasing it and they took everything. Mm -hmm. So the city let us go to the warehouse and pick. We have a surplus warehouse. So most of the furniture in there belongs to the city and sometimes they put, excuse me, they auction it. Mm -hmm. So at any given time, the city could go and pull. It's like. That sounds Yeah, amazing. I don't know that we would do that yeah. I mean, and take away <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's GBIC, older, our it's economic older development stuff. A partner. That. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. older stuff. and Trust that we wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> yeah, don't take their furniture. But it's older stuff that has, some of it has surpassed its lifetime. Yeah, I think um, the understanding with this item is that it's typically not spent. Yeah. It's just budgeted. Okay. Just in case. Right. Uh, maintenance of the building. This particular item was increased was increased and, and the recommendation of the board was to, uh, I don't know if you've been to the Young House lately, Mayor Commission, but there's some parts that are not up to standard. So we added a little bit more money into this particular line item so that we can maintain the historical house of Young House to standard. Under the contract, who has a responsibility to maintain? We do have a service agreement with the city of Brownsville and they do maintain the grounds, for example, and the like, but not necessarily the structure, uh, is your structure itself or something. That's so, 741? So they do help, 741? They do help yes. with some major items. This would be for minor items, like the rails. Some of them are rotting in the bottom. So we, the board agreed to up this particular line item, line item just in case we need some budget for it. And again, it's not necessarily meaning that we will spend it. It's just there in case we need to work with the city to uh, make the right uh, repairs. Well, uh, does BCIC, because they're co-tenants, so do they kind of help with yes, this sir, as well? Yes, sir. Typically on common areas like this, we share costs with, with BCIC. So are we questioning, are you, are you finished with your presentation? With that, with, no, sir. Uh, I'm not finished with the presentation. The next item is miscellaneous services. Uh, you can see them listed, listed there on your document. Uh, this particular one uh, was added, some funds were added. The board agreed that uh, we should engage with some membership dues with some areas. For example, the governor's economic development office recommends that we be part of the Go Big in Texas um, membership. And the board agreed to up the membership a little bit higher than we typically have. So this, this particular line I'm reflects most of it is uh, around membership dues. How many workshops did you have with the board on the budget? Sir? How many workshops did you have with the board? We had, we had one official uh, workshop, but we had several um, exchanges of material okay. in between. Do you have a budget committee? We, we do not have a budget committee. We opted, or the board opted, to have a workshop and have the workshop make the recommendations, and then the recommendations were made were made on a regular GBIC board meeting. Okay, uh, this particular professional services, uh, this, this is where the GBIC attorney uh, monies come from. That's not inclusive of all of it. That's just budgeted in case there's other professional services required throughout the year. Typically, this particular lineup is not spent uh, completely also. Uh, usually it's just a GBIC attorney's fees. And a GBIC attorney was hired on 1 October. How much was that budget item last year? How much was expended on that item? I believe just the 90, just the uh, just the GBIC attorney's fees were spent last year. So you spent 90,000 last year? I thought you just yes, said sir. that. Yes, sir. But wasn't he paid $5,000 a month? That's 60,000, no? Uh, 
I'm not sure there was some transition in between in between a couple of attorneys looking at Mr. DeCos, but my understanding is that this particular nine item, only the Jibic attorney's fees were spent. And so there's so do no you, change. Do you hire, do you ever use uh, for, uh, legal services besides whoever is your attorney of record? Uh, during, during my time, we have not, but I understand that prior attorney, Mr. Luis Hernandez did. Uh, there was an attorney in San Antonio. I don't know that attorney. I've seen, I've seen some data on the prior expenditures. So, but uh, so to answer your question, yes, there has been a time where where uh, a different attorney was hired. And the new attorney that was hired, um, do they have a set fee per month? Five thousand, yes, ma'am. Okay. You did you mention that the city of Brownsville did the the lawn and the maintenance or the uh, landscape stuff. We we call them whenever we need some some major work within the area. Uh, but we have them looking at Jenny. We do have a contract with a contractor that comes by uh, every other week. So that's what the so. eighty four hundred is. Yes. Um, and how do you um, what do you contemplate? You you have here professional or travel for professional development, 15,000, I guess, in dues and stuff. And then um, board professional, that's 770 and 770-01. So then over on 767 and 767 you have 80,000 for staff travel. Right. And then uh, 20,000 for board travel. So, if I, can, I mean, I know one's education, but what are you contemplating spending 80,000 on trying for to find it on your here. staff? Seven, Line seven, item seven six seven. I mean, do you have some trips planned? Right. Uh, good question, yes, sir. So again, I, I mentioned earlier when, when I presented earlier around uh, the the um, tip strategies recommendations on a strategic plan that GBIC being so new and BDC used to typically uh, manage the recruiting part of economic development, so they would travel and try to recruit companies into Brownsville. That hasn't happened. So in the prior, in the prior year, uh, we haven't really traveled to recruit. We haven't gone to missions and Were things like that. Were they successful in, in doing that, in bringing any companies down when they did that? My understanding is there were some, yes. Any uh, from Colombia? <laughs> wait, uh, well, wait, but come on, let's stick to the agenda. I'm talking yeah. about the budget and what that, and how. But this is future forecasting. Well, my opinion on this is is that the the staff travel is really high, but I'm expecting your board to kind of be very uh, vigilant of the expenses on that. Th that's one of the reasons I'm I'm looking at this, and I, I know your board looked through it, and I know that yes, they sir. went through workshops and they ultimately approved it. I'm sure that there were some changes. Yes, but sir. I think actually, this is pretty high, but I'm expecting that there's going to be some sort of return on any. Any sort of travel that's done, I'm sure your board's going to keep an eye on it. Yes, sir. Again, this is this will be part of that dashboard that we showed you. That's one one of the several items that we report would be this part, uh, the recruiting part, and dashboard will show us. Uh, to Mr. Nisa's point, is was it effective or not? Effective or not? So then we would change that particular strategy. And so maybe as a courtesy, GBIC could also follow the city procedures on travel. Um, I know that GBIC and PUB and all of these boards, you know, they can stay in a five-star hotel if they want, but the city has certain per diem caps. Yes. Maybe just as a courtesy that GBIC could follow the same um, procedures. Understood. Yes, ma'am. I never traveled on GBIC, but I understood if I wanted to, I could have. <laughs> yes. We can provide that to GBIC. And BCIC and maybe everybody else, just Absolutely. to kind of cut costs down and make sure they understand that this is tax, uh, sales tax. Right. Yes, yes ma'am. And again, that's, I think this is what you were alluding to, the landscaping and maintenance item. Uh, committed incentives, these are incentives that have been committed for years, most of them. You see capital landfills, you see CK, you see SATA, for example. You can see what commit the commitments are for this particular fiscal year for this particular budget, and then the con the, the the balance of that particular contract, as so you can see the numbers there. And so this next one is non-incentives projects, and you know you know most of them the city of Brownsville's um, airport renovations, um, and then also the city of Brownsville's airport new terminal, those dollars amounts and the and the commitment going forward, and also Vida Vida is a is a nonprofit that the board agreed during last board meeting to continue funding. 
and those are the non -in non incentive projects uh, pending. Overall, you see the breakdown of the budget. 42% are committed in seven projects, and you can see the percentage breakdown on the other items. And that's the uh, completes the presentation of the GBIC fiscal year budget. Our request is for the mayor and the commission to approve it. Do you have a, is there a fund balance? Do you have fund balance or do you have surplus? Sir, uh, off the top of my head, the, the, annual, the annual surplus Currently, based on incentives then, and commitments, it's about 600000 okay. left over. Okay. Uh, I believe Vita would take half of that. Okay. The reason I'm asking is I think, I mean, some of this stuff is pretty high. I know, like I said, I know your board went through it, but I'd consider maybe in the future going forward, maybe some more professional development. Yes, uh, that's always good. They already good. spent half of it, sorry. <laughs> they already spent yeah. half of it before it even got approved, well, at least for the board. Yes, sir. There are there are there are the mandatory type A through TDC or through the state mandatory courses like the tax class. Uh, the staff and the board has to take it, and then there's also some mandatory classes that the staff needs to take. So we're in the process of filling those out. And on the professional services and marketing, that's kind of a one time. Is that going to be this year only, or are you considering right, this allocating? particular budget is for just this year? Yes. Okay. Sir. All right. We'll be reconsidered again the following year. Uh, uh, um, to your point about what's left over in the budget, we do have a 20-year outlook document that we can share with you, and it, it kind of shows uh, what does it look like with five-year commitments. I think the airport's a five-year commitment. I think South is a little bit longer, so it shows what that outlook looks like without any future major expenditures, and we can share that with you as well. Any other questions? So um, just bring us results. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. Next, we have action item number four, consideration and discussion regarding the Greater Brownsville Incentive Corporation's implementation and compliance with Section 501 of the Texas Local Government Code. I ask that this agenda item be included, um, and the reason was because at that point I still didn't know if the Jibic board had already approved the budget. I think you all need to follow timelines strictly. You, your fiscal year ended October or September 30th or 31st, um, and so uh, in the future we need you to submit your, your budget for the next year. The state law says that the city commission has to approve all expenses before they're made, uh, before they're made. And so the fact that you're getting it approved in November is, was of great concern to me. So I'm glad that you finally got a budget to present, but in the future I would ask that you please follow um, the timelines, so be timely. And, and I just want the board to be real conscious of the money that they're spending and, and making sure they get a return on it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And if so, if the budget didn't clearly provide for one of the expenses that you're gonna get, then please bring it to our attention. And um, we have meetings often enough that we should be able to work with your timeline. And, and I have one more comment. But it's really not on the agenda, so I'll keep it to myself. OK. All right, so that's, uh, there's not going to be any action. Okay. You're, no. No, no need for that. No, OK. I just wanted to vent. <laughs> Item number five. Action item number five, consideration action to approve the 2020 City Commission meeting schedule. No, I'm Griselda, City Secretary. <laughs> um, at this time, what we wanted to do is bring the calendar to you. As per City Charter, we do need to have at least one City Commission meeting per month. This is the calendar in front of you. Um, we'd ask if you all would approve it or if you all want to make any changes because uh, past practice has been in July that we only have one meeting and then I know for the November and the December meetings we have those meetings back to back. So, okay. Do you all like to make any suggestions? So I would like one meeting in July. That's my kids off time. I agree. Which Not my July. Kids, that's, but a, I agree. that's the one that I was <laughs> looking at. Time. Yeah, because didn't we only have one this past July? Yes. yes, correct. July is usually the one where people may take vacation, so right. that may need to be adjusted. But if we approve this, we can always maybe cancel that unless you want to just do it now. Just do it now. Rather just do it. You want to just do the seventh? 
And then remove the 21st? Okay, that's fine. And then August is budget month, no? So we have a meeting every month, every week every that month? Every week. Okay. I thought that so was September. Is it August as well? Typically August or? It's more in, in August. It's August. So I know this schedule like the back of my then, hand. <laughs> and then in September we have a meeting where we have it on Monday and Tuesday. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so if we can reflect that on the calendar. So then do I have a motion then just to amend to remove the 21st, unless there's any other dates? Also, Mr. Nice, we sorry. need to adjust November and November and December. Okay. Yeah, so do you want to move the 17th of November up to the 10th and the 15th of December up to the 8th and have them back to back? Yes, let's do that. That's fine with me. That's what we I mean, typically do. As long as everybody's okay with it, I'm fine with it. They just, yeah. as long as somebody's writing this That's down. That's good. Yeah. Uh, well, I would, I would move that we make those changes. Agree, to second. We have a motion and a second uh, to amend as discussed. Do I have uh, any further discussion? No. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Well, Those opposed? I had one quick question. Where is charities on this? This is February. It's the last weekend of the month. It's okay. the 27th, 28th, 29th. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So December stays the same, the 1st and the 15th, or are you asking to move it to the 1st? 1st and the 8th. 1st and the 8th. Uh, eighth. 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 So and November, November 3rd, 3rd and 10th, and, 10th, and yeah. then December 1st and 8th. And then we take out the 21st of July, right? Taking yeah. out the 21st of July? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, motion can we have passed. a re-vote on that? I think, it was, I think it was interrupted before we took No, the, the vote, it, everybody voted and passed. Okay, I, I, I didn't catch that. Okay, well, just for council's benefit. It then. made me feel to sleep better at night, right? All right. <laughs> there is a motion and a second. Yeah, there was a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Thank you. You Thank can you. sleep now. <laughs> Next, we have action item number six, consideration action to approve the Brownsville Border Film Commission bylaws. Is anybody presenting this? Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commission. Um, staff was asked to create an advisory body responsible for providing guidance and advice on the City of Brownsville's communications and marketing with respect to the Brownsville Border Film Commission. The bylaws are before you today, and I think this is um, in a way to support and foster um, this specific media industries in Brownsville um, with that produce content such as motion pictures, television, commercials, corporate videos, music videos, documentary, still photography, and other emerging types of media and data. Who drafted these? Do we know? The city of Actually, I can say that I had some hand in it on this one, uh, in conjunction with with management, and, All right. and also we worked in conjunction with the uh, with some of the past members of the film commission. So uh, it's a joint effort. Yeah, my concern was a conflict of interest, but I saw that it's in there, so I'm good with it. Thank you, sir. We did research the in detail um, to to ensure that there was avoidance of that com any conflict of interest through the creation of an advisory body. Right. Okay. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Yeah. Uh, the, what is the relationship to the, and have we already created the Film Commission Office of the City of Brownsville? It's, it's housed within the Communications and Marketing Department, which is a new department under the new structure. And so there, the director will begin November 18th, and we will make sure that we have an officer. Just like you have a Main Street officer or a liaison, you, we would have an officer so assigned to them. the meetings. Absolutely. The minutes, the posting, the everything that they need to make them successful. That's, that's good. Okay. okay. So we, um, any additional discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Next we, oh. Next, we have an executive session. Uh, executive session eight, attorney consultation pursuant to section 551.071 of the Texas Government Code to receive legal advice and counsel in connection with the city's rights, duties, privileges, and obligations related to the collective bargaining labor agreement between the city and the duly recognized bargaining agent for the city's law enforcement personnel, the Brownsville Police Officers Association. Motion to move to executive session. We have a motion second. and a second. Any discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay.
Back from executive session. It is now 7.07. We have a possible action on any items discussed in executive session. Action executive session A, consideration and possible action if any in response to the last collective bargaining proposal by the Bronzo Police Officers Association with respect to health care, base salary, contract term, and related items. There's not going to be any action on this item. Uh, we've instructed council to go back uh, to the representative for the union to try and get something done. So with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Stand adjourned.